This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Healthcare paralyzed in Nigerian public hospitals as doctors go on strike yet again. Egypt ramps up anti-terrorism efforts as dozens of militants are killed in North Sinai region. And the United Nations warns that millions of people in South Sudan are at risk of famine. Hello and thank you for joining us on Africa Live. I am Penina Karibe. Joining me in studio with the business headlines is Uche. Thank you, Penina. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Fit. The United Arab Emirates lifts a ban on transit flights from Nigeria and Uganda, amongst other nations. And one in two Nigerians seeking to leave the country in search of greener pastures. Of course, all that coming up within the program for now, Fact Check. Thanks, Uche. We begin in Nigeria, where doctors in public hospitals have resumed a strike over poor pay after the government failed to respond to their demands. The indefinite strike by the National Association of Resident Doctors comes three months after its previous one. To get a feel of the situation on the ground, we earlier spoke to CGTN's Deji Badmas in Lagos. Virtually all the state hospitals in this country are now affected, not just at the state, even at the local government level as well. It, it's, it's obviously going to affect uh, uh, the efforts now to fight that pandemic seriously, uh, even though the strike just started yesterday, but we're beginning to, uh, I think from today we'll begin to see the effect. Now let me just, uh, let me say this so our, our audience can really understand. The bulk of COVID-19 patients in this country actually go to government facilities for treatment because um, those are the facilities that are actually approved for the treatment of COVID-19. Of course, you have um, a, a few uh, private facilities, but some of these private facilities are just too expensive. So most Nigerians cannot afford to go to these private facilities. So most of the isolation centers you have in this country today are owned by the government. And the, the bulk of the doctors who work at these facilities are resident doctors. So, I mean, it, it, it paints a clear picture of how terrible uh, the situation would be going forward if this is not quickly resolved, because obviously you're not going to have doctors attend to COVID-19 patients. You no, know, one of the reasons why the doctors have gone on strike is that uh, they have complained that they do not have uh, PPE, that's uh, protective equipment. Uh, they're asking for not just better welfare, even hazard allowance treating COVID-19 patients. So um, as this goes forward, uh, if it's not resolved as quickly as possible, things are going to get worse. And this is coming at a time when Nigeria is now officially uh, experiencing the third wave of the virus and infection rates are spiraling. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just something one cannot contemplate and uh, everyone hopes that the government resolves this as quickly as possible. Still in Nigeria, the country has received over 4 million doses of the Moderna vaccine from the United States. This is the second batch of vaccines to arrive in Africa's most populous nation after a similar amount of AstraZeneca vaccines were delivered in March under the COVAX scheme. The latest vaccines are expected to boost the country's vaccination program as authorities prepare for a third wave of infections driven by the Delta variant. Faisal Shoaib, who is the head of the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, thanked the U.S. government for the donation. We've been able to uh, get another consignment of vaccines to help towards uh, our quest to provide herd immunity against COVID-19 so that we will begin to take those strong and definitive steps towards uh, returning our lives and livelihoods back uh, to normal. The Moderna vaccine is very, very effective uh, in providing protection against uh, the Delta uh, variant. Tunisia has received a new donation of COVID-19 vaccine doses from China. The Sinovac vaccines will be administered to Tunisian citizens under the supervision of the Military Health Directorate and the National Health Department. Adnet Shawashi reports. The Chinese vaccine doses were delivered at the military airport in Tunis on Monday. Today we are witnessing a new wave of solidarity from the People's Republic of China with this donation of the Chinese vaccines. 
Tunisia thanks China for its support and endless aid that has helped our country step up the vaccination campaign and face the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chinese ambassador to Tunisia declared that China will always support the North African state. He added that Beijing's support is part of President Xi Jinping's vision for the common good of humanity. Despite all the difficulties we are facing, Tunisians can be reassured that the Chinese government and people will always stand by your side. We always consider that in order to fight this pandemic, we need to reinforce international cooperation. The virus has no frontier and the vaccine has become one of the efficient solutions to stem the spread of the virus. That's why the Chinese president declared last year that Chinese vaccines would be a global public good. The director general of military health said that China's donations during the pandemic have helped Tunisia's medics and paramedics cope with the health crisis. This important batch of Chinese vaccines will encourage all healthcare workers and all the departments managing the crisis to accelerate the vaccination campaign. We invite all Tunisians to get inoculated. The vaccines are the only solution to overcome this pandemic situation. According to the health department, Tunisia received Chinese donations of the Sinovac vaccine in March and June this year. Tunisian authorities and the population have welcomed the new Chinese donation. The Chinese ambassador to Tunisia pointed out that China will work hand in hand with Tunisia in order to overcome this unprecedented global health crisis. Abdel Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Three countries within the Southern African Development Community, or SADC, are in the process of deploying troops to assist Mozambique. Mozambique has been fighting to quell a deadly insurgency in the country's northernmost province, Cabo Delgado. Botswana, South Africa and Angola have deployed troops to join the 1,000-strong Rwandan force already in the country. Angela Kupler has more on this story. Analysts familiar with the insurgency say the situation is complicated. It dates back many decades. Mozambique's neighbours have started to sit up and take notice in the past 18 months. The other countries are worried that this sort of thing might spread. Uh, the insurgent groups have in fact said if South Africa gets involved, they will have revenge attacks. They also have links to groups like uh, Islamic State. And, uh, you know, there's a potential for, for terrorism to, to come to everybody's shores. It's been suggested that the troop deployments may lead to increased regional tensions as troops congregate on an area and engage the insurgents. One doesn't know how they are going to collaborate, cooperate, or maybe even come into conflict with the Rwandan soldiers, because apparently there are uh, uh, as many as a thousand troops from Rwanda, and they certainly are battle-hardened. So I think this is going to be a test of SADC's resolve um, and there's been uneasiness from the Mozambican government to accept a force, but oh, that seems to have been resolved now. But, uh, you know, I think uh, any time that you're deploying troops in your region has got to be a concern for citizens. Analysts say that the regional grouping has an opportunity to get involved in a multi-dimensional approach to their mission. Decides on how the SADC is dealing with civilians, how SADC is dealing with the human rights, how SADC is uh, acting under the rule of law. This will define the success, whether the failure or of SADC on the ground. Multinational troop deployments can be tricky affairs, analysts say, and it's made more complicated by the fact that these insurgents are tried and tested and battle-hardened. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. The Egyptian military announced on Sunday it had killed dozens of terrorists in its restive North Sinai region. The announcement follows a terrorist attack where at least six military officers died. Here's Adel Mahri with the details. This week, the Egyptian Armed Forces released its first counter-terrorism progress report in months. In a promotional video released online, the military spokesperson says Egyptian forces have killed 89 terrorists. The military announcement came after ISIL claimed responsibility for an attack in North Sinai. ISIL have not vanished in the Sinai. They have been lying low for some time now to regain their strength as they try to recover from the implications of the comprehensive counter-terrorism campaign which was led by Egyptian military. Their remnants have been regrouping. 
They've started with minor attacks such as planting explosives on military roads or sniper attacks until recently when they led a big attack against a military checkpoint. The Armed Forces report says recent military efforts have located 13 underground smuggling tunnels that connect to Gaza. Expanding operations across Egypt, they've destroyed 200 vehicles which carried arms and individuals who tried to breach the borders with Libya and Sudan. The Egyptian military is considered the most successful army in facing domestic terrorism when it is compared to regional armies like in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Nigeria and others where extremist groups are continuously growing. No army will be able to eliminate terrorism. It is an ideology. Rather, the Egyptian army is trying to win waves of terrorist activities and so far they've been very successful in that. Since 2013, Egypt has faced an unprecedented insurgency, mostly in North Sinai. In 2018, the Egyptian military launched its biggest counter-terrorism campaign, which has seen the frequency of terrorist attacks significantly dropping. The Egyptian armed forces is upscaling its counter-terrorism raids. It's focusing on interrupting terrorist financing channels. The army's latest report announced discovering nearly 2,000 farms that cultivate cannabis and opium puppies, which can be processed into drugs that inject cash to these groups. Adel Mahoui, CGTN, Cairo. Hundreds of lawmakers on Monday were sworn into a newly created national parliament in South Sudan. This was a long overdue condition of the 2018 peace deal that ended civil war in the young country. 588 MPs took the oath of office. The legislators are a mix of delegates from the ruling party and former rebel factions who signed the truce. The swearing in comes nearly a year behind schedule and remains incomplete. 62 MPs were absent from the ceremony, some because of disagreement with the government over the power sharing arrangement. I'm sure you are aware that the challenges ahead of us are enormous. To confront and overcome those challenges, the situation demands that we, as the representative of our people, should look beyond political, partisan, and tribal expediencies and focus keenly on the common good of all. Our people are fed up of wars. As their representatives, we ought to be the people at the front of the efforts to recognize that plight. Therefore, in carrying out our leadership roles, we must lead by example. Still in South Sudan, the United Nations is warning that millions of people are at risk of famine unless there is a massive international effort to mobilize aid. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports. Rose Ngero is a 20-year-old mother of three. Her family is displaced due to intercommunal conflict. The family now depends on food aid and eats only one meal a day. Rose's young child is malnourished and sick. My child is sick. She's vomiting. She has diarrhea. The doctor told me that the child must have eaten something dirty. I think the problem is from water. We have food given by aid agencies, but there is no clean water. UNICEF says 8.3 million people in South Sudan need humanitarian aid. Years of civil war displaced farmers and denied them opportunity to cultivate. From 2018, relative peace returned to the country, but relentless rains led to flooding in the past two years, washing away crops and livestock. Now it is rainy season in South Sudan and most of the northern parts of the country are again flooding. UNICEF says more than 300,000 children are expected to suffer from severe malnourishment and could die if treatment is not provided. South Sudan's government says it is aware of the acute food shortages and that it is working to address the challenges children are facing. Breastfeeding rates since the independence, it is not enough because three out of 10 children today are still being denied of their right of breastfeeding and the start of life. But right now, for women like Rose Ngero, their only hope is to rely on support from aid agencies. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. It's quarter past the hour. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break coming up. 
Germany confronts its role in colonial exploitation as it returns stolen artifacts to Nigeria. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out. Go there and you find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back. For some, they are rare artworks, centerpieces of Europe's biggest museums. For others, they're painful reminders of colonialism and exploitation. Now, Germany has become the latest country to return precious antiquities to the original places where they were taken from. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. Well, this is the Humboldt Forum, an $800 million museum which has just opened here in the historic centre of Berlin. But this colossal project has been controversial on several fronts. Firstly, it sits on the site of the former East German Parliament, which was demolished to make way for this new project. And as for the design, well, you could be mistaken for thinking that this is a seat of power for some sort of royal family. And that's because the building largely is a replica of a Prussian palace which sat here for hundreds of years before being lost to Allied bombing in World War II. But it's what was meant to be inside this place that's become the real flashpoint, particularly for Germany's relations with Africa. The museum had planned to display the Benin bronzes, ancient sculptures that once decorated the former Kingdom of Benin, an area which is now southern Nigeria. But that, as you might imagine, has been hugely controversial. That's because the artefacts were stolen by British soldiers in the late 19th century, brought back to Europe and then sold off to various European and North American museums. And while Germany has held on to theirs ever since, activists have long said it's time to give them back. Despite some initial pushback, years of campaigning and calls between Abuja and Berlin has paid off and has finally seen an agreement on restitution of the ancient antiquities. Authorities here say the official restitution process will begin next year and it is expected that some of the sculptures will be housed in a new museum in Benin City. But there are questions about whether the whole collection will be sent home or just a few items. But it still is a significant step, one for Germany in particular, who's been forced to confront its role in colonialism and exploitation as well as for other countries, including the UK, as pressure builds on them to return the ancient relics to their rightful home. Trent Murray, CGTN, Berlin. There's growing recognition of the prevalence of mental illnesses in Africa. However, the range of medical services available remains alarmingly low, and mental disorders are still stigmatized. In some communities, tension exists between the traditional, the spiritual, and the medical fields in the treatment of mental illnesses. CGTN's Lindy Mtongana traveled to Kisumu in Kenya to explore this issue further for this episode of Panorama Africa. This story contains images that some viewers may find disturbing. Mm -hmm. 
a port city on the shores of Lake Victoria, Kisumu is the largest city in Western Kenya. Its social, political and economic significance has made it a key player in Kenya's pre- and post-independent history. It's also home to Father John Pesa, founder of the Holy Ghost Coptic Church of Africa and a self-proclaimed healer of the mentally ill. Father John Pesa's Sunday service is well underway for a congregation of the faithful and his patients. It is a smaller crowd than usual due to pandemic regulations, he tells us. Even so, it is clear the cleric enjoys a loyal and abiding following. How many people love me? <laughs> Father Pesa's reputation precedes him. He's been healing the sick since 1961, he claims, but no stranger to controversy. Father Pesa's methods and practice, including chaining his patients, have earned him fierce criticism. Imagine you are alone dealing with five unstable people. What would you do? And yet some have the wandering disease, where they just move around aimlessly. If you leave that person, they might just wander off. What if a person gets hit by a car? What will you tell the family that put this patient under your care? So we chain them. Unexpectedly, Pesa conducts a seemingly staged demonstration of how his healing works. He is going into a trance. His mind is resting. I'm the one who produces his spiritual power. It's the power that is doing this. That is the power of God that heals people at Coptic Church. God is the only one who knows what he does and how it heals. It is a natural factor beyond my human knowledge. Even I don't know. Natural factor beyond human knowledge. Whenever I touch someone and they fall into a trance, gradually they begin to change. That change is what shows me the person is healed. A short drive from Pesa's church brings us to Maseno University, where we meet Professor Otieno Omolo. The retired physician turned lecturer was among Kenya's first cohort of child psychiatrists and once led the country's only psychiatric hospital. His disregard for Father Pesa is evident. That is somebody who is completely ignorant of whatever he's doing. And most of the things you are talking about, I'm aware of them. People being chained and all, those are criminal activities. And it is unfortunate that uh, 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 the, the, the judicial arm or the executive arm is not taking action against that. The judicial arm has tried. Last year, a court ordered PESA to pay damages of up to $5,000 for violating a young man's freedom of movement and right to education. But the courts can do little when patients are voluntarily placed in the cleric's care by their own relatives. A former patient's unshakable trust in Father Pesa and his methods is evidence of that. Yes, at one time when, uh, when I was uh, like somehow becoming violent, then uh, I, I was also chained. Yes, but that is just to control those who may be violent. You see, some of these uh, illnesses. Uh, they may not be treated fully in, in our hospitals or medically. So that's why prayers are also important. And faith healing is very real and it works. In many cases, faith healers operate in a gray area, not formally regulated either by the church or government. And this is where abuses can take place. In 2020, a Human Rights Watch report revealed how men, women and children with psychosocial disabilities are chained or locked in confined spaces in 60 countries across Asia, Africa, Europe, the Middle East and the Americas. Professor Omolo suggests the formalization of spiritual counseling would help eliminate abuses. 
After all, spirituality can contribute to an individual's healing. Now, as a scientist, as a medic, of course, uh, I don't think prayers would do help anybody as such directly. However, I'm very much aware of spirituality. I'm very much aware of the fact that when you are talking of quality of life, which of course is both physical and uh, mental, isn't it? Uh, the issue of the spiritual domain is important. People who have strong faith or who believe in something generally tend to have a better outcome than somebody who just has no belief in anything. Because it gives us, most, most times spirituality gives us some sort of a direction. The influence of the spiritual domain gives legitimacy to alternative healing practices, especially on a continent where clinical mental health services are scarce. In Africa, the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 people ranges from 0.01 in Burundi, 0.2 here in Kenya, and 2.4 in Mauritius. But this is a far cry from high-income countries with an average of nine psychiatrists per 100,000 people. The leading causes of mental illness in Africa include poverty, war and conflict, insufficient resources and living with other diseases such as HIV AIDS or cancer. The coronavirus pandemic has raised levels of stress and trauma globally, making the situation even more dire. A 2016 UN report identified depression, anxiety, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder as the most common mental illnesses in Africa. But often, lack of awareness renders these disorders invisible until sufferers display severe and dramatic symptoms. To make matters worse, Africa has insufficient outpatient facilities and hospital beds for patients with mental illnesses. This means that the proportion of Africans who go untreated ranges from 75% in South Africa to 90% in Ethiopia and Nigeria. This is known as the treatment gap. In South Africa, the treatment gap is sometimes filled by traditional healers known as sangomas, who diagnose and heal through divination, herbal medicine and rituals. The ability to heal is considered a gift or a calling bestowed by one's ancestors that must then be honed and developed through guided training. Sangomas claim to treat physical, spiritual and mental disorders. We give them some things to smoke and medicines to drink, but it depends on what's disturbing them. Sometimes it's because they have a spiritual calling or they're dealing with bad spirits. Where traditional treatments might not work, Gogo Shabalala refers her patients to medical doctors. We work together with doctors. We respect each other's gifts. You have gifts and I have mine. Unethical healers have been known to take advantage of people's beliefs. Some people use a gift for the wrong things. They go to school to become a traditional healer, but don't actually stay the course. They don't finish. Ultimately, a sangoma is a healer, not a killer. There is a shift emerging in the policy response to mental health in parts of Africa. In 2020, Kenya became the first country on the continent to appoint a task force and a presidential advisor on mental health. This signaled a growing awareness of the scale of mental health problems. In 2019, the government recognized the need to really look at mental health in its totality in our country against the background of the fact that depression was going up, domestic violence was going up, suicides were going up, alcohol use disorders were going up. And our task force was asked to establish why. The task force went right through the country, talked to all manner of people in the private sector, in religion, armed forces, government itself, and reported in July of last year, that in fact, we have a huge problem with mental health in our country against a very small uh, investment of finance and of human resources. Dr. Njenga is also the chairperson of a chain of private mental health hospitals in Nairobi. For those who can afford it, the facilities treat psychiatric disorders in a safe and secure environment. 
The hospital's emphasis on dignity is reflected in the design, clinical approach and relationship with patients, all in an effort to produce the best outcomes and fight the stigma associated with mental illness. The reason people stigmatized uh, mental health before is because they were hopeless and helpless and they, they felt that there's nothing we could do to help them. Now, as the, um, the dark night is coming to an end, uh, people are realizing that actually the earlier you get care, uh, the more likely that you get a good outcome out of it. And that, for me, is uh, what will hit the biggest blow against stigma. Knowledge, information, and good outcomes. Awareness and destigmatization is also being driven by a new generation of mental health advocates, such as broadcast journalist Eugene Mweri. I went into mental health as a whole because of my own personal story. So early in 2017, um, I was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety. Unfortunately, that came after my first suicide attempt. Let me remind you that in Kenya, here we are, Suicide is a criminal offence under the constitution, which means you can get arrested for trying to take your own life. You can end up in a cell. Knowing that, I still went public with my own story. Nobody deserves to be at the point where they feel that you are so alone. I mean, you, you're deserving of nothing, and there's nothing left to tether you to this world. Nobody deserves to get to that point at all. Through advocacy and establishing an emergency support network, Mweri is changing the narrative around mental health and connecting those in crisis with professionals. It's work he does not take lightly. The generations that are coming are more emotionally aware, more in touch with their emotions than the generations before. So the idea of talking things out needs to be encouraged now more than ever. More needs to be done for mental health in Africa, but there is hope. Young people across the continent are bringing the conversation on mental wellness to the fore. Learn about mental health, share with your friends so that we can have... Alongside the work of experts, ethical healers and medical practitioners, mental health policy and practice may well change for the better. Lindim Tongana, CGTN, Nairobi. Kenya. Well, it's time now to catch up with the day's business news. Let's cross over to Ucha for the latest. Thanks, Benina. And coming up on Africa Live this. The United Arab Emirates lifts a ban on transit flights from Nigeria and Uganda, amongst other nations. And one in two Nigerians seeking to leave the country in search of greener pastures. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. Now, the United Arab Emirates will lift a ban on transit passenger traffic from Nigeria, Uganda, India and Pakistan, Pakistan rather, amongst other countries, from August the 5th. Now, the National Emergency and Crisis Management Authority, however, said on Tuesday that passengers will need to be present to present negative PCR tests taken 72 hours prior to departure. Final destination approval will also have to be provided. Now, the UAE is a major international travel hub and has banned passengers from many South Asian and African nations for several months now, due, of course, to the coronavirus pandemic. 
And the World Bank says 50% of Nigerians want to leave the country to seek better economic opportunities abroad. Now, a recent report says unemployment and other socio-economic challenges have contributed to people trying to leave the country in search of improved lives elsewhere. Yes, CGTN's Kelechi Emekalam with more. 31-year-old Wanne Kamweze lives in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The 2014 graduate of microbiology turned to professional bead making after her years of job hunting didn't yield much. Her business, too, has been on a downward spiral. She complains that doing well in an economy like that of Nigeria has become increasingly difficult. So leaving the country is now top on her agenda. I applied for Nigerian prisons, I applied for Nigerian immigration, I applied for so many federal processes, but I couldn't get. So I was like, okay, focus on your bead making. And even like now till now, it's still a struggle, but still no job yet. Lately, I can't even make up to 4,000 euros, but before I used to make up to 10, the cost of materials are very high. I started searching the web, looking for a scholarship that can, at least that can get free scholarship to the next, to study and just leave this country and I'm just done. I know that I have a good skill and yeah, the government doesn't appreciate it. Outside there, you can actually assess a loan. You know, you can, they can give you a loan to start up your business and make your life a little bit easier. One neck is among millions of Nigerians who are desperate to relocate abroad. A recent report by the World Bank revealed that about 50% of Nigerians want to migrate in search of greener pastures. That's 20% more than the figure recorded in 2014. I'm tired of this country. And everywhere, every day you'll just be thinking about how to make it. And when you wake up, you'll be thinking how to put food in your mouth. There's no uh, on any other alternative. Go to school, you will not see job. My passport is ready. Oh, any opportunity, if, give, if given a visa, I'll fly out and that's it for me. Experts say the number of those who want to leave the country could be higher. Human beings that naturally gravitate to better environments, socioeconomic, political environments. And that is because the government of the country has, or the country itself, has not been doing so well. And um, so people definitely want to go to different greener pastures, so to speak, where they feel their potentials or opportunities will be harnessed and you have more better potentials in terms of getting jobs and even health, education and uh, medical um, treatments. So um, that statistics for me is even low. For several years, Nigeria has been experiencing brain drain. Key sectors like health and the academia are some of the worst hit. The West African nation spends billions of dollars training professionals only to lose them to other countries. To reverse the trend, experts say Nigeria would have to improve workers' wages, the condition of service, infrastructural development, and policies that would enable businesses to flourish. Kilechi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. And let's head to Tanzania now, where the central bank is directing $432 million to financial institutions in the country in order to help them lend more to the private sector. Now, the move is in an effort to mitigate the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Here's CGTN's Isaac Lucando with the details. Tanzania's economy had experienced close to 7% growth for a decade before the COVID-19 pandemic brought the momentum to a halt. The country's central bank now wants to give the economy a boost by getting more businesses to borrow. It says despite improvements in recent times, current borrowing rates are not encouraging. Mikopo. Loans from commercial banks to the private sector had grown by 15% and lending rates had gone down from 20 to 17% but that is still a very high rate. The central bank plans to guarantee loans to the private sector so that they are issued at a more affordable interest rate. This economist says achieving this will not be easy. If you have an economy whereby top four banks, all of them, they have got the very same structure, lending to employees instead of lending to SMEs and businesses, it takes a lot of time and it will take very long time for the private sector to flourish because there's no 
private sector that can flourish in an environment such as this one. Because you'll be guaranteed that whenever you ask for a loan, your loan will be declined. Tanzania's economy dropped to 2% growth last year on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic, but performed well compared to the rest of Africa. Avoiding lockdowns and increased revenue from the mining sector helped the country survive the worst effects of the pandemic. According to the World Bank, the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to the deterioration of business sales and incomes in Tanzania. As a result, the number of Tanzanians living in poverty is estimated to have increased by 600,000 last year. The central bank says its push for affordable loans is specifically targeting the agricultural sector, which employs at least 65% of the population. The bank hopes the move will have far-reaching effects. Now is not the time that we're going to sell a luxury good like tourism. So the only good that we can sell right now is necessities. Necessities are food. Food we obtain them from agribusiness, fishing, and farming, like, you know, uh, livestock keeping. So that is the sector the government is trying to focus on, which is a very big plus. The central bank has forecast a 5.6% growth rate for the economy this year. It hopes favorable lending rates will help achieve this goal, boosting bottom lines for businesses and improving lives. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Now, the rise in South Africa's producer price inflation does not bode well for the overall domestic inflation outlook. Producers in the country are now passing on costs to consumers who, of course, are already under financial strain. Here's Angelo Coppola with more. Producer inflation unexpectedly jumped to 7.7% year-on-year in June from an already elevated 7.4% in May. One area feeding the pressure is the metals and engineering sector. One of the key major uh, input costs into the metals engineering sector, uh, from the production point of view, it's actually coming from the mining sector. And then uh, on average, uh, for the last six months to June, uh, we've seen prices in the mining sector products uh, actually increasing by, on average, 17%. So that is quite concerning for us because it's putting a pressure in terms of profit margins from the industry point of view. As South Africa comes to terms with the economic costs of the arson and looting, the impact was very clearly on supply chains. It had a, a little bit of a disruptions, but I think we are glad that no, there is some normality in, which is returning and the security has been built up. So in, in the next three months or so, I think we will we'll see a proper return in terms of production patterns. The short-term prospects for producer inflation are not optimistic, according to analysts. I think with the oil prices going up and commodity prices going up, and along with internal problems like electricity, supply shortages, uh, and disruptions, it's very likely to increase beyond 8.5%, 9%. Um, at the moment, we're on the highest level that we've been in seven years. It's very likely that we'll pass the 8.5% mark, and once we do that, it'll be the highest in 10 years. This isn't good news for consumers in the short term. It's going to be very difficult for the Reserve Bank to maintain interest rates this low in this environment. Um, I think there'll be another monetary policy committee meeting where we will get away without a rate cut, but the one in about four months' time will be very difficult for them not to give a rate increase, purely because the inflation and the PPI are now both well above the repo rate and in fact, one of them is above the, the actual prime rate. Analysts are concerned about the sustained and elevated food and petroleum related product price inflation, which they say poses upside pressure on headline producer inflation. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Meanwhile, Libya has reopened the main coastal road that connects its eastern and western cities. The road had been closed since a military offensive in 2019 by the Libyan National Army in order to capture the capital, Tripoli. Here's our correspondent, Adel El Marouri, with the details. For two years, the main highway that connects Libya's western cities to the eastern ones has been blocked. Over a month ago, Prime Minister Abdel Hamid de Beba opened the coastal road from his home city, Tripoli. Yet the Libyan National Army resisted the move. It wasn't until Friday that the commander of the LNA, Khalifa Haftar, announced the operation of the vital road on the other end. The convoys that moved between the east and the west used to travel an additional 700 kilometers because of the coastal road closure. 
Now, thank God, this is an excellent facilitation to the Libyan people. I think the way the reopening was announced is more of a political propaganda for Khalifa Haftar, who may run for president in the next election. The 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission, a body that includes representatives of Eastern and Western forces, approved the reopening of the road after removing almost all security threats. All armed forces have withdrawn five kilometers south of the highway. Landmines were cleared, giving a 200-meter buffer on both sides of the road. Militia groups, though, are the remaining obstacle against a regular flow of vehicles on that vital connector between Libyan cities. After agreeing on the reopening of the coastal road, we called for a meeting with the UN Libyan envoy Jan Kurbish in Geneva with the sponsor nations of the Berlin Conference to discuss the evacuation of militias and foreign fighters that will guarantee the safety of the coastal road and Libya's stability. Libya's neighbors have welcomed the reopening of the coastal road. The UN support mission in Libya named it a historical achievement. That's not just for simply allowing cars to travel on a highway, but rather because rival Libyan factions have agreed on something. And that is a great indication that division is fading and that Libyans might, after all, agree on holding their elections. Adel Mahoui, CGTN, Cairo. Now, the Global Digital Economy Conference has opened in Beijing, China, from artificial intelligence moderators to human stealth technology. The conference will showcase the latest advances in, in innovative digital technologies. Now, a major highlight of the conference is the approval of a plan uh, to transform Beijing by 2030 into a model city for the global digital economy. This year's Global Digital Economy Conference will hold more than 20 parallel forums and launch the events across venues in Beijing and Lhasa. The event aim is to integrate resources to build a new platform to lead the development and cooperation of digital economy around the world. Meanwhile, 14 selected leading enterprises showcased their efforts in this regard. Some exhibitions, like the simulation software wear for rocket launches, enable the public to enjoy the experience while providing valuable reference material for engineers and designers. First, we build a model of the real complicated equipment. That means we will construct a digital twin. Then we can experiment on this digital twin to predict the possible results. In this way, it will enhance efficiency, minimize the production period, and reduce costs for R&D and operation in industry system. The conference also particularly exhibits the latest application of digital technology in quantum communication and computing, industrial internet, AI video repairing and blockchain. Some other digital technology in medical areas are another highlight of the event. Now we can use tens or even hundreds of thousands of clinical cases to establish the system with data marked by the best doctors in top hospitals. This kind of application of technology innovation was not rare. Currently, the big data technology and artificial intelligence has also been largely applied to clinical imaging diagnosis in COVID-19 pandemic, cerebral stroke and heart diseases. Liu Zhaoqin, CGTN. And that's all for now on Africa Live Biz, but coming up later on Global Business Africa, Ethiopia will reopen bidding for its second telecoms operator license this month, including the right to operate mobile financial services. Of course, we'll have all those details at the top of the hour for now. Back to opinion. Thank you, Uche. You're watching Africa Live coming up in sports. Namibia's Christine Boma surprises the athletics world 